Kia ora and welcome to this week's episode of The Niche Cast. We are from The Niche Case, theniche-case.com, and we have been sent here from a far-off planet to deliver Aotearoa sporting kōrero content and yarn. Love a bit of Aotearoa sport, love a bit of Aotearoa, and there are always fresh, funky, insightful yarns to be found about Aotearoa sport on our website, theniche-case.com. Fresh up on the website, we've got the latest Flying Kiwis wrap. There's going to be a Libby Kakache breakdown as well, which the wildcard will talk through later on in the podcast. I've just done a yarn breaking down the Trent Bolt contract situation, which we will also discuss. Um, you can check in with Joey Manu's legendary mahi. There's lots of little black caps tracking yarns as well from their European excursion, and there'll be plenty more now that they're facing the West Indies. And, you know, White Ferns Commonwealth Games recap. There might be a Black Sticks Commonwealth Games recap. There's under-20s Wahine football insights to be found there as well. So basically, if you can read and you do like a bit of a reading exercise, read all about our Aotearoa sport on our website, theniche-cache.com. And if you can read good and you love our content and you also use your tardingers to listen to our podcasts and you like what you hear, you're liking what you're reading, Jump on the Patreon, whānau, patreon.com forward slash our niche cash, e our niche cash. That is the best way to support us straight up the guts. We appreciate all the members of our Patreon whānau. And there's an extra Black Caps podcast there at the moment. We previewed their series against the West Indies with lots of little weird anecdotes and notes. So check that out. Otherwise, your support is uh, fantastic at the moment. We're still on the rise, still on the come up, and we'd love to be doing a whole lot more stuff for our Patreon whānau and for our Aotearoa sporting content, but we're just where we are at right now, and it's all good. So join our Patreon whānau, patreon.com forward slash our niche cash, straight up the guts, supporting us on our mission to broadcast Aotearoa sporting excellence, and for now, there's an extra Black Caps podcast there every week. We're heading into summer. Woo! Could be Amando a listen that one. And tomorrow's Friday, which means a email dispatch will be sent out via Ravens and Owls. Friday evening, thenichecase.substack.com. Sign up, enter your email address, and you get all the niche cache content delivered to your email inbox. So you can get off social media. You get all the links to our website and all the podcast information is part of that email. Then there's extra Aotearoa Sporting yarns sent out through that email as well. We touch on some relevant current eventy newsy type of things, and we just break shit down however you want it. Email, website, podcast, and you can support us straight out the guts via Patreon as well. We always start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness, which is whipped up by the wildcard. Whippy wildcard, what do you got? Yeah, I got this from Mr. Lao Tzu, who said, the highest truth cannot be put into words, which alone is already a good mindfulness right there. The highest truth cannot be put into words, but there is more to it. Um, he says, the highest truth cannot be put into words. Therefore, the greatest teacher has nothing to say. He simply gives himself in service and never worries. That wasn't as succinct as you have the doses of mindfulness so there's a, there's a lot in there it feels like a um feels like the Trent Bolt type of contract situation there's a lot there a lot of nuance a lot of uh details <laughs> and stuff you got to explore to really get amongst it um but you, it just seems like there's benefit to be found in the peace and quiet and the less wo less words more just being the wisdom as opposed to sharing the wisdom, just living out your wisdom is sharing that wisdom in a different way. I don't think that was specifically what your Lao Tzu was it was referring to, but that, that was my interpretation. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I liked in particular that start bit there, the highest truth cannot be put into words where, because it, when you think about it, like, Anytime you put something into words, it's 
Do you know you know how when like um someone I don't know writes a, a a poem in like Spanish or something like that, and then it gets translated into English, and you read the English version, and and you sort of know you're not getting the one hundred percent full experience because it's been translated. Like there's a layer of sort of like distance between the original and what you get. Um, I sort of think that way about like because anytime you put words to anything, you're describing something. You're sort of translating a truth like a universal truth in a way and so it, it there is that layer there just in terms of just describe trying to put anything into words kind of puts that sort of layer of distance in there um therefore like the highest truth the purest kind of um the purest most universal truths it would make sense that you can't act actually accurately describe them because even in describing them you're going to lose something from like the essence of what what that truth actually is you know what i mean i feels yeah I feel you, and especially if we're all just trying to live our truth. If we're all trying to live our truth, yeah, and you can't really describe your truth or that truth to your existence, then it taps into a bit more meditation, a bit more peace, a bit more calm energy, and just letting that truth be the truth, as opposed to, yeah, this is who I am, this is what I do, and I'm going to do this. My career is going this way, and I'm in, I'm living my truth because of this, this, and this. Now, nah, just live. Just be yourself. Just live your own truth without much fuss. And uh, I don't know. Us Kiwis, less chat the better. More mahi, less chatting. That's what we're about here in Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. And wildcard, <laughs> you have done a fantastic job of documenting Stephen Adams and Sean Marks in the NBA. Stephen Adams, fantastic uh, NBA player. And you have highlighted all sorts of gritty, grindy mahi that Sean, uh, Stephen Adams does. And you've also done a really good job of documenting how Sean Marks has gone about his mahi with the Brooklyn Nets. With, and that started a few years ago when he made the, he kind of in instilled a bit of culture and grit and mana in that Brooklyn Nets team to build it up. And then came the KD, Kevin Durant, and Kyrie Irving situation. They added James Harden. And right now, Kevin Durant is... Uh, let's just say Kevin Durant wouldn't really fit into the Aotearoa sporting landscape with the caliber of uh, people and team-first ideals and sacrifice and selflessness and those type of ethics that we hold close to us in Aotearoa sport. And as someone you like, as we said, you're you're covering Sean Marks closely. You're you're tapped in, tuned in with what Sean Marks has been doing, what he is doing. My question to you to start off this podcast is: Are you off Kevin Durant? Because I'm I'm a bit like fuck KD. Always loved him as a basketball player, but what he's doing to the bro Sean Marks right now, I'm just like I'm off you, bro. Like you're not. You just don't captivate me in any way shape or form and i'm sticking with the bro sean marks how are you feeling i i still love him as a player kevin durant um i just think he's a fantastic player and the weird thing is like the way the way he operates on the basketball court kind of does still fit that like team first um the old title of sports mentality thing to an extent he's the star player obviously when any team he plays for um but he he's a guy who loves the processes he's a guy who loves to train hard and um doesn't think necessarily like doesn't freak out about the short term and stuff like that he's like a lot of those things he's ticked boxes but let's not forget that Sean Marks is not the first Kiwi basketballing presence that he has crossed either because you know he, he did Stephen Adams pretty dirty once upon a time him as well when he left the golden when he left for the golden state warriors when they were teammates at oklahoma city um lost to the warriors in the in the western conference finals in seven games um then he joins the warriors the very next season uh it's uh that's, <laughs> i mean we've seen him link up with uh james harden again since those days i i don't know if a uh, kd and russell westbrook union reunion is ever really on the cards because Russ didn't take that too well. Um, and I was, yeah, I mean, kind of been nice for Stephen Adams either when your best player goes to one of your biggest 
festivals. Now he's doing dirty to um to Sean Marks. It's I don't know. There's there's a little bit of a pattern emerging here, and it's not it's not a nice one. I still love the dude as a basketball player, but this is such a weird situation where it's like everything he's asking them for they kind of already had before Kevin Durant went there, and then when Kevin Durant went there. They pretty much like decided, okay, well, we gotta we gotta lean into this. If you're gonna go for the big stars and you gotta lean into it and keep them happy. And so they just like appeased everything that Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving as well wanted. And it didn't work. And now Kevin Durant's pissed off with them for doing everything they wanted them to, and it's not working. Like what we we wanna go from there. I don't know. Um it's felt already felt like a trade was probably the best scenario as long as they can get a decent like like decent draft package or whatever, or you know, a couple um couple other play like couple young players to build from going into the future. If they can get that back in return, then sweet ass. Let's just trade the guy here. Like it's no one's happy right now. Um, I think they're just playing hardball in terms of getting to that trade. And I think we're seeing a little bit of um, I don't know, uh Kevin Durant and James Harden are still good mates. Like that was um James Harden supposedly fell out a little bit with Kyrie Irving while he was in Brooklyn, but not with Kevin Durant. Rant. like those two get on pretty well james harden's an expert at getting himself traded like he's done all the tricks it was that time in houston where he turned up looking like he had six jumpers on um to make him look overweight or whatever and then all of a sudden he gets to um uh brooklyn it was first and then he, he looks fit as a fiddle kind of thing um he he knows how to get himself traded maybe given kevin durant a few pointers in that in that direction in which case maybe stephen adams can give sure marks a few pointers on how it's to uh not worry like how to deal with kevin durant um it was, we'll see how it goes well, i don't yeah a trade for all parties seems like the best case scenario right now because this this is a really strange situation and especially strange that the same dude has somehow managed to burn bridges with the only two major kiwi presences in the nba that's 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 not ideal and because of that i'm from aotearoa so fuck kevin durant like he's is messing with the only two people from Aotearoa in the NBA. So that's going to obviously uh, shade my perception of Kevin Durant. I'm actually leaning towards Sean Marks just, and, and Joe Sai, like there, it's the whole, Sean Marks represents the whole Brooklyn Nets organization. Like Sean Marks, just don't do anything. Who cares? Like just let KD rot as a, like not playing basketball and just see what happens. Like if KD wants to go that far, just play, like just see what happens and um that's what i'm leaning towards i want sean marks to do like the trade oh, the trade makes sense yeah and that seems like the most logical thing for all parties involved but as an emotional kiwi i'm a bit like just just let kd simmer away not playing basketball up Shits creek because this is what he wanted Let's bring it closer to home here, Wildcard. NBL basketball is reaching a climax with finals going down right now. We have games tonight, Thursday evening. We're recording this Thursday midday. So we've got the Taranaki Ears facing the Auckland Tuatara. And then tomorrow there's a game between Nelson and Otago. Fantastic games last night, especially the Auckland uh, Tuatara getting up over the Wellington Saints and Otago defeated the Hawks Bay Hawks to get into their finals matchup. Because these games are kind of ongoing and we'll have uh, greater clarity with the situation come next week for the Variety Show, which I'm sure you'll include a couple of notes about this in next week's Variety Show. But right now, like, what's the most pressing, important crucial nugget of information to share about the nbl heading into this kind of last stand of finals basketball and now Ted, a really fun competition and i've especially really enjoyed the international flavor of the uh, tauihi competition but as you said in last week's variety show tauihi finals are next week they're their own separate thing after that blokes nbl so what's just like one main thought that you've got about the blokes nbl right now heading into this finals weekend or well, finals fixtures taranaki versus auckland tonight thursday night nelson versus otago tomorrow night friday night and then i imagine it's the final on saturday yeah final on saturday 
Um, I I think the I mean, at this point, like we're what like um forty percent through the playoffs. We've had the two playing games. We've got the two semifinals coming up tonight and tomorrow, and then final the day after. Like with it all ongoing and everything happening so quickly, it's a little hard to like break down specifics. But honestly, like the the that's the reason why the main the main point just needs to be like what a fun, enjoyable, entertaining competition this has been and a high standard too and like quality imports you saw that from otago last night where um it's a little bit of a shame there to be honest because the that hawks bay team is a largely like um you know like four well-known kiwi dudes and one import in their starting lineup kind of thing this is an otago team that's um a little more spread out there with the in particular american dudes coming in but their imports were great like so <laughs> those dude, like boyd had i think 30 um what did he get there uh let me get the box score boyd had 30 um williams had 24 you also got a nice little contribution from the Nicole mcculloch bouncing back from um i think he was in the 3x3 team for the com games and had to pull out because he got COVID at a late stage so bouncing back from the rona nice with 19 points there Timmons with a you know 12 and 10 um they're a fun team and defensively they kind of choked the hawks and looked looks pretty you know um Pretty strong there. I, I was I was impressed by that. I actually thought both those two playing games were going to go the other direction. I thought the Hawks would get up over the Nuggets, and I thought the Saints would beat the Tortata. Um, the Saints Tortata was just a fantastic game. Like that's a great example of just how strong this competition's been and how enjoyable. And like that was um, what was that? I think that was fourth versus fifth on the table. So it's not even like the top seeds, and it felt like a final. Um, Tortata with a great first half. Saints just a little bit off it, but they made a you know big comeback in the second half. I did briefly take the lead and been down as much as like, I think it was, I think got up to about 16 points or something. Um, Xavier Cooks was immense. The Aussie uh, import, he's, <laughs> he was a real coup bringing him over to the to the league. Uh, good boys with Tom Vodanovic from the Sydney Kings last season on their championship run. Cooks comes in, wins MVP. He had 26 and 16 or something ridiculous in this one. Yeah, 26 and 16, um, but not quite enough because the Tortata just... Um, you know, that old man Chris Johnson looking fantastic. But in particular, I've like talked about the Nuggets getting through their game on the back of some strong import play. Tortata's two top scorers were Rob Lowe, you know, veteran Kiwi big man at this point, um, had a rough season with the Breakers where he just fell out of the rotation for no apparent reason, even though they were losing every game. And clearly his skill set is like a stretch big man would have been pretty handy. He does you don't see him shooting so many threes for the Tortara, though. I will say he's very much like the inside man, um, getting in the paint, finishing up close. He was great, 24 points. And then a uh, young fella, Taki Ferenson, with 24 points, seven rebounds, five assists, and some like he, he was he was off his shot a bit in the first half in particular, but it was some like clutch plays with the bucket making and scoring late on. And he was huge for them. Taki Ferenson got to highlight him because he. He's coming off what was a pretty impressive, like he was in that tall black squad that went to the Asia Cup and, and finished third. And he was, you know, a, a big player for them in a couple of big games as well. And, and here he is in a in a playoff game in the um in the NBL coming up huge as well. So it's I mean, this is the joy of watching this competition is you do have strong import players who can come in and dominate and do amazing things. Xavier Cooks had like a um not quite a reverse stunt, but it was like driving along the baseline and then he sort of as in mid he sort of swapped hands to go with the offhand to, to dunk it. It was unreal. Um, plays like that from an import player, but then also you got like like reliable dudes like, um, you know, Rob Lowe and Tom Vodanovich actually had this like back and forth thing going all game where it's like one was fouling the other, one was fouling the other. It was getting real niggly. And they're breakers teammates next season. So that was fun. <laughs> it's always, always enjoyable when you get a bit of that. You got like the reliable known NBL presence to it's like that but then also a younger dude like Taki Ferenson coming up like massive and a big moment like a huge fourth quarter from him it's like that's the full like that's the full list of ingredients you know that's every every item on the shopping list ticked off there like all the different varieties that you dominant imports like reliable enjoyable kiwi guys but also young um, local players pushing through and and doing well when it matters as well like that's 
and, and, the, and competitive games. Like the, the, the caliber of the coaching, I think in particular in the league is really strong this year. Like some of the, the coaches involved um, and, and you just get I, I, all like, I mean, so summarizing point here, I just think the NBL has been fantastic and everything I'm saying here about the NBL applies to the Tauihi women's competition as well. It's the same, exactly the same, like all those same tick the boxes, you know, um, it's just been, it's, it's just been really good. And it, there's three more games left in the season as we record this and they're bound to be three more like rip snorting classics as well. So there you go. Big up all the rip snorters. Taki Ula Ferenson apparently went to Auckland Grammar School. He played three years with the Portland Pilots in college basketball. And he apparently he was playing in Germany prior to this NBL season. So he played for the Tuatara last season. And then he spent, um, spent a season in Germany with Team E. Hingen up Erspring. And then he's back with the Auckland Tuatara. So shout out Takiola Ferenson. Was he one of the best players at that Asia Cup campaign for the Tall Blacks? Um, it's, it's, yeah, it alternated a bit from like game to game. Um, different guys would stand up. He definitely had a couple games where he was, you know, one of the two or three very best players on the, on the court. So I would say so. I'd say he was one of the guys who was able to have like match winning impacts throughout the way, along with guys like, you know, Flynn Cameron and, um, and pro probably a bit of Sam Timmons, but definitely Toy Smith Milner. Um, yeah, you know, those kind of guys. Yeah, I'd say Taki Ferenson was up there as well. Would not be surprised to see him get an NBL contract this time. I think the German stint was sort of like, and uh, I'm not sure on this, um, might be speaking out of turn here, but I think he does have some German heritage, um, uh, something like that. So there might have been something along those lines, but like I think it was kind of a lower tier kind of fun yeah, European division, overseas yeah. experience. So not exactly. Exactly the the level of um of German basketball that like Finn Delaney is going to play in the next season or or Ty Webster has done in the past, but you know nicer looks excursion for him. I yeah I would not be shocked to see him pop up on an uh, NBL roster as a probably as a development player at this point. But you know that's a uh, definitely I would say he's one of those guys from this competition, and there are a few others who are sort of like putting their hands up for that kind of consideration. Definitely, you you absolutely will have guys like. Every every coach slash scout or whatever, or every NBL team is keeping a close eye on a competition like this for sure. It's, you know, Xavier Cooks doesn't pop out there by accident. You know what I mean? Highly doubt Tucky Ferenson will uh, join the the celebrated Aotearoa basketball nursery development ground of the Aotearoa Breakers, but um, hopefully he finds a better development step in the NBL. Um, to join. Speaking of Valtteroa Sporting Development Wildcard, we've got some under 20s Wahine football happening. They had a one all draw with Mexico, took the lead early, scored an early goal, and then um, seemed like Mexico were generally on top, flicking between that and the Black Caps this morning, Thursday morning. Um, and then Mexico scored a bit of a stink. Uh, goal to to tie it up one all according to yourself they now play germany on saturday how are you tracking this under under 20s wahine football aotearoa we know aotearoa football like aotearoa basketball like aotearoa rugby league like, like aotearoa cricket all these sports are humming along firing on all cylinders with a big v8 electric v8 motor or a shout out to electric cars as well if you're into um those well I was, I was thinking like what's the firing on all cylinders electric vehicle thing you know i'm i'll, I'll have to learn about that one humming along actually might apply to that because those cars just hum along um but any takeaways from the out Al out under 20s wahine team how are they tracking at this world cup game against germany they'll be niggly germany always pretty good at football um, but we know Aotearoa, especially Wahine football, younger age bracket, these ladies are pretty good. I will, my observation, one observation here, wildcard for you. Now you'll be eagerly anticipating this. 
I did note Gemma Lewis, the coach, pretty hyped at the start of the game. She was like, they were waiting to play Gemma Lewis on the sideline. She was like, yeah, come on. Ah. And then it cut to the Mexican coach and she was just like, what the fuck's going on? And then I happily saw a uh, <laughs> less than happy look on the Mexican coach's face after that one all draw. So that was a, uh, that was my summer summarization of the game. How did you view this and how are you just like, should we get excited about this team? Are they a plucky underdog Kiwi outfit? Are they capable of going deep into this World Cup? Like, what's your general vibe on the back of that one all draw versus Mexico? Well, in a funny way, I kind of think all of the above. <laughs> I think they are a plucky underdog team. I think they are a team to get excited about. And I think they do have potential of going deep in the competition but most teams have potential of going deep in the competition in in youth football world cups is the thing like it's it's really hard to know coming in like it's not like you're playing against these teams week in week out it's not like they even play that much anyway so you don't really have like the scouting videos or whatever or knowing what to expect and everyone's a developing player so even if you got footage of their last you know look at the last a-league season of some of these um kiwi players if you wanted to scout them there well they've had like several months of of like relatively intense training and preparation since then so you don't know what else like what other you know tools they've add to the, added to the toolkit it's just and and the strength of the the senior national teams don't always relate to the strength of the youth national teams as well so coming into this tournament looking at the draw that the uh, that the um the junior ferns there had i'm thinking well germany's the <laughs> germany's the most difficult team here um germany's the most difficult team mixes Mexico is going to be a tough ask, but maybe we can get something off them. And maybe Colombia is the team we can beat. I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking that for like first instincts. Well, we drew with Mexico, which was nice, but we were like second best team for, for a lot of that, particularly particularly second half, um, which is, a, you know, that's how it goes. They still got the result, which just makes it a better performance to, to get what they got out of it. Um, but Colombia beat Germany 1-0 in the other game. So that for, kind of throws the cat amongst the pigeons there hard to know does that mean that german team is gettable or does that just mean that the german team is what we expect but colombia is also extremely good and this was the easiest per se team that we'll face in mexico i don't know like we'll, you, you don't really you don't understand these things until you actually go out and play you sort of just got to focus on your own thing and if you, your team's strong enough you'll get the results you deserve but you won't sort of know if you deserve them until after the games it's like youth world cup 101 um i yeah, like, you know, Jim Lewis was the coach of the Wellington Phoenix team. Is still is the coach of the Wellington Phoenix team. There's several players there that are from that, that Wellington Phoenix team. This is part of the reason why I, I did write, like, a hype piece about them last week, saying, like, no team that I can remember has gone to a, a Youth World Cup um, from Aotearoa who is, like, as well prepared as this because the whole spine of their team has been playing professional football together with the same coach um and and for the last a-league season like and you add in several other quite exciting players along the way to to like you know fill that squad out um it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to going to go deep in the thing like, you can't predict those things for all the reasons i just said but like it does mean that they have a chance and it does mean that i was sitting there watching them play against mexico this morning feeling like we can just hold out now we can go up and grab a winner and then maybe, you know, um, or, it's, you know, I feeling almost a tinge of disappointment that we didn't, that we went a little bit more clinical, particularly in the first half that we let sort of Mexico get on top late stages of that game, nothing to do, but just like bring on defensive subs, try to hold on, protect the point that they already had, which they did um, through six minutes of stoppage time and everything else. Like players were collapsing with, with cramps and um, injury knocks and fatigue and everything. Like it looked exhausting this this tournament's in costa rica i'm imagining that the heat and humidity is rather unforgiving in, in that part of the world at the moment this time of the year uh, so it goes but um that's just like the the battle of attrition as they say but definitely in the first half and in the early stage of the second half i thought there were there were times where if they were just a little bit more clinical if the first touch was a little bit better they might have they might have sparked a few more things like they had the potential to to um to score a couple goals again Mexico. The, the one they got was a big deflection from off a Grace Pozneski shot, but 
I mean, even that, like they earned that. They win the ball in the midfield, carry it forward and transition. Defense is going to stand up. Okay, well, I'm going to have a shot then. Catch the deflection. Keeper doesn't save the deflection like she probably should have. That's that's how it goes. Um, whereas Murphy Sheaf was a little bit surprised to see starting a goal over Brianna Edwards, um, but thought she had an excellent game. One massive save in particular, but other than that, just kind of like making in the making the expected saves nice and flawless which you you couldn't say the mexican keeper did you know the the one that she had to make she didn't like and that's why this was a draw and not a mexico win uh, mexico's finishing wasn't fantastic either which is another thing but on the whole like normally new zealand team goes to these tournaments you're thinking a draw is like an unbelievable result here i'm thinking a draw is you know, a good solid result they performed well they could have done better they could have done worse um that's a sign of like the extent to which like the I don't, I don't know the um the confidence i have in this team i guess and some of the players that are out there um it's just different expectations and it was a weird one sitting there thinking because normally you're just you're hoping for anything like when a new zealand team goes to any kind of fifa event you just hope for anything here i'm like i'm not hoping i'm expecting like, i'm expecting not necessarily expecting a result but at least expecting them to be in it's like challenging for a result which they did and which they got and which was pretty impressive um yeah like that's that's not normal um but maybe it's becoming normal because i had similar feelings about the the men's team at the olympics the under 23s and about the men's under 20s in the last thing as well where they also like made the knockouts um not to mention the women's under 17s in 2018 who got you know bronze medalists and grace wasniski and marissa vandermeer and also macy Fraser, I think, who was an unused sub in this game, but the other two played the full thing. All part of that squad. Um, you know, maybe like if you look at the bulk of all of these tournaments that have come since, and these New Zealand teams have all gone and been competitive, maybe those old ideas about like just going there to make up the numbers and hoping for anything, something maybe we'll get lucky and scrape a goal. Maybe that needs to change. You know, <laughs> maybe we can put to bed that kind of the old the old fashioned way of thinking and be like, well, actually, we're developing good young players good young good youth teams and there's actually now a pattern of us going to these junior world cups and being competitive and getting results off of far more favored footballing nations one of those blokes players who has been a key figure in in the rise of Aotearoa men's football and especially more recent years is Libby Kakache and you're writing about Kakache at the moment. So I'm just curious, is there one takeaway from your mahi that you'd like to share that has stuck with you during this writing process about Kakache? And I imagine he's coming into a season. Hasn't quite started yet. That's why you're writing about him. Yeah, they did have a, a Coppa Italia game last week. Um, for which he was an unused sub, but the Serie A season starts this upcoming weekend. And um, yeah, they wrote a, wrote a preview looking at like the state of the team. They've changed managers since last year, which could turn out to be a, a pretty relevant thing in Kakache's case. Um, also, they're just a team that goes through a lot of loan signings. Um, it's only the second season back in the top flight. So when you need to strengthen your team in a hurry, it's hard to spend a lot of money you don't have a lot of, if you don't have any money to spend so you just get loan players from bit like from other teams that's how you fill out your squad um and also you get loan players who have options to buy down the line which is what happened with kakachi and several others as well so they have actually managed to i think they had 10 loan players last season all of whom played pretty much half the games they were available for at least so a large portion of their squad were temporary guys but about four of them have come back kakachi is signed on a permanent and then one other guy was two other guys have been the same deal another one um chucked on a just a, a second loan um so there's a little bit of con like there's a little bit of a lack of continuity there in that squad and a few things but um in terms of the the one major thing it's it, it's all about that duel between for the starting left back spot um between the right Kakache and between a, a local fella come through the not come through the academy actually i think I think they bought him from a lower league team when he was a, a few years younger, uh, but a fella called Fabiano Parisi. So these two last year pretty much swapped starts for like Parisi wasn't the 
Well, they had a guy called Ricardo, Ma- Ricardo Marchisi, I think is his name, who was the starting left back for the first half of the season. But Parisi he was slowly starting to work his way in and get um, get bigger and bigger cameos off the bench, a few alternating starts kind of thing. And then Marchisi got injured, busted an ACL, done for the season. He was one of their loan signings. So um, the, the, he also like, yeah, that, that was pretty much the trigger to sign Kakache. It's like, well, this guy wasn't going to, and come back next season anyway. And also now he's injured for the rest of the season. We need another left back. So they sign Kakache. He comes in. Kakache makes his debut off the bench, sort of it gets a, it gets his first start about three or four appearances in. And then from that point onwards, I think the next nine games in a row, it was Kakache starts one, Parisi starts one, Kakache starts one, Parisi starts one. And this alternating thing, then at the end of the season, Parisi started to get like three or four starts in a row and, and Kakache was a little bit less. So Parisi played the entirety of that Coppa Italia game. So Parisi will be the first choice guy, but Kakache is not that far off. And that's kind of what I broke down in the article. Um, it's quite a, it's quite, quite a funky little duel because they're both the same age. They're both 21 years old, um, both signed permanently to the club, which as I've sort of said, that's not the case with everyone at that team. Um, so they are like, not just, not just tidy first team players, but also both of them investments for the club who they'll think good young dudes, develop them a little, little further couple years sell them on big fee that's how we make our money that's how we can afford to sign more players in the future um as i say parisi is a little bit further ahead but it's an interesting deal because parisi is a better attacking player um only had one assist and no goals last season which doesn't back it up but he is like you to look at like the underlying stats um crosses shots and 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 all those kind of things um progressive passes and whatnot parisi is clearly superior to kakache because that is one aspect of kakache his game that just hasn't translated since the A-League. He, he struggled to get involved in, in attack and in the positive ways we saw from him at the Phoenix while he was at St. Trayden. Still the case at Empoli, but Kakachi is the superior defender. He's, you know, he wins his tackles, he makes interceptions, he's just more solid at the back there, great work rate. That's what this season is about. And like to summarize it in a, in a, in a short little like, um, you know, pithy sentence, effectively for Libby Kakache, his first full season in Empoli, it's just about closing that gap between his defensive prowess and his attacking sort of deficiencies. Because if he does, he's second choice to Parisi right now, but he starts chipping in good crosses and, and setting up goals and stuff, suddenly that changes. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the goal for Libby is all about, like, become an attacking force like we saw from him at the Wellington Phoenix. That's the next step in his career. That's what hopefully this season will be about. That brings us to a interesting situation wildcard with a young chap by the name of Trent Bolt, who dramatically dipped out of the Black Caps New Zealand cricket contracting pool. And there are a couple of, I wrote about this in depth, so if you want the full yarn, check that out on our website, thenews-case.com, as well as that Kikache yarn, which will be live in the coming 24 hours. But there are some key points about Bolt that just make it easier to understand. The first is that international global cricket is scared right now. There's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear, and there's a lot of insecurity about the state of the international game, all these T20 leagues popping up and the money involved, and that is shading the whole perception around Trent Bolt. Interestingly, Trent Bolt specifically referenced his uh, Fano time and wanting to spend more time with the Fano as the reason for this decision to opt out of the Black Caps contract. But everyone else viewed it as Trent Bolt wants to play in all these T20 leagues around the world and make a lot of money. That is because of this global insecurity that cricket is suffering right now. So just keep that in mind as we work through this process and... Yes, there's a lot of money in T20 cricket, and yes, these are changing times, but a lot of the coverage is shaded by crickets and securities and their fears and their anxieties. That is like a blanket over this uh, Trent Bolt situation. That's the lens that everyone else is viewing it through. Fair enough. Trent Bolt might be opting for the money. Who knows? We don't know that. I'm just sharing my opinion and my perspective. Um... But we know Trent Bolt is a pretty nice, humble Kiwi chap. We know he loves his Fano, And we know Trent Bolt has already taken a lot of time away from the Black Caps 
to spend with his whānau because the thing about Trent Bolt is that he hasn't been playing a lot of cricket lately. He played a lot of ODI games in 2019 for the World Cup. Yes, there was the pandemic and the amount of fixtures decreased, but Trent Bolt didn't really play ODI cricket after the 2019 ODI World Cup. Then we came into the T20 World Cup last year, and prior to that T20 World Cup, Trent Bolt wasn't playing a lot of T20 international cricket. And his number of tests have decreased. Yes, the number of tests Aotearoa has played has decreased as well, but we had a situation last summer where I think Trent Bolt made himself unavailable for the South African Test Series because of Fano. So Trent Bolt has already been picking and choosing his moments for the Black Caps. Um, I came up with the phrase dictating his availability, which sounds a bit more hectic than picking and choosing his spots. Either way, Trent Bolt, probably the second best seam bowler Aotearoa has ever produced. He has earned the right to pick and choose his spots and how and when he plays cricket for Aotearoa. And this is just, I view it as just a more formalized arrangement. Because Trent Bolt wasn't playing random T20 international series against Pakistan. No, he was chilling. He was taking a break from cricket. Then there might have been an ODI series against Bangladesh. Trent Bolt's not playing that. Because Trent Bolt's an absolute legend. He doesn't need to. And he there was a mutual understanding between here and New Zealand cricket that his workload would be managed. And now that's just a more formalized situation. And without a contract, Trent Bolt is not obliged to anything with New Zealand cricket now. So that might just lead to a um, more stress-free situation. He doesn't have obligations, corporate obligations, sponsorship obligations. All that stuff is released and he can still represent Aotearoa because as we learn wildcard about Aotearoa cricket contracts, they mean nothing to fans. You can st and players will still play for Aotearoa without a contract. In fact, I'd say for the women's side, there's good like the best players don't have contracts. We're now seeing Jimmy Neesham. Remember all the kerfuffle about Jimmy Neesham? Oh my God, Jimmy Neesham's dropped. He's he's lost his contract. Jimmy Neesham's career's you know up shit's creek. All Jimmy Neesham has done since then is play for the Black Caps. So it's a bit of a storm in a teacup, really, I, I kind of think. And there is some benefit to New Zealand cricket. Because what we know about the New Zealand cricket Black Caps contracts is they are, the value of those contracts is ranked on, for some players, their legendary status. Otherwise, it's just like, this player holds this value to us. I said Trent Bolt is the second best seamer Aotearoa has ever seen. In this Black Caps crew, group, he's probably the second best cricketer, second highest rank behind Kane Williamson. So his contract value will be pretty high if he's if Kane Williamson is the only bloke sitting ahead of him. Um, depending on this on their contract value, maybe Kane Williamson he, as captain, his is probably a bit higher. But Trent Bolt, Tim Southey, those type of characters are pretty high up in that list. So New Zealand cricket were paying Trent Bolt a lot of money to take breaks from the Black Caps. That doesn't seem like a financial common sense situation. So I'm not saying that New Zealand cricket instigated this. That is not the truth. Trent Bolt, by all accounts, instigated this situation to dip out of the contract to play a pool. There are many benefits for Trent Bolt in that regard. But this also benefits New Zealand cricket because they're not paying Trent Bolt to take a break from the Black Caps every summer, which is what he has done for the last three to four years. He has just, him and New Zealand cricket have just managed things really well where random ODI series, Trent Bolt doesn't need to play. Random T20 series, Trent Bolt doesn't need to play. And moving forward, Trent Bolt can still play as much cricket as he wants for Aotearoa because wildcard, it would be absolutely bonkers if New Zealand cricket and Black Caps selectors 
chose a contracted player who is not as good as Trent Bolt ahead of Trent Bolt when Trent Bolt has made himself available. That makes no sense. And that basically translates to Trent Bolt can do whatever the fuck he wants, whenever he wants. And that makes sense. It does. Um, and most important factor of all is the one you started off with. It's like, he's already been doing this. <laughs> As he said, it's just a formalizing of an arrangement that was already the case. It's just that it used to be case by case basis where it's like series by series selections coming out. Oh, Trent, we're going to give Trent Bolt a rest here to, to ease his workload. And maybe Kane Williamson's not going to play this 2020 series as well or whatever. Like they've been doing things like that at all the time it's not necessarily been bolt standing out by himself it's definitely like even on the european tour we saw they didn't want anyone to be there from the start of the test series against england to the end of the 2020 series against netherlands that was a specific even not even the coaches like gary stead wasn't there the whole time coaching every game um it was a specific thing it's like this is this is a long tour it's a long time away we're just gonna like uh theseus has shipped this if you know what i mean um the, there's a there's a philosophical thing about Theseus's ship where it's like the ship leaves um leaves the Greek harbors or whatever on some journey and along the way every as it goes it's like this bit of like the the mast breaks down let's get a new mast to replace it some of the cladding outside whatever and by the end of the journey it returns to Greece and the ship is the same ship but every single detail of it has been changed since it started like every bit has been replaced by another it's so it's like a thing is this 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 same thing what's that black caps team the same team that finished it as the was well yeah it's still the black caps the essence is still the black caps but they're all completely different players by the end of the tour kind of thing um trim bolt's been yeah trim bolt's been doing that for a long time um and it's been a black caps uh what's i wouldn't say it's been like a rule or anything like that but it's definitely been a tendency to to lean into that you know a player welfare let's not burn these guys out we've seen what that looks it's like because the worst case scenario is you chase Ben Stokes away from ODI cricket kind of thing. He, he's just like, it's impossible. I can't keep playing. I have to retire. England plays too many games. And Trent Bolt hasn't retired. It, he's not done that. He's said, I'll play sometimes and not play other times. And yeah, the, the, the one, like, yeah, well, you, you break it down like that and it's like, well, nothing's actually changed. <laughs> we're exactly the same situation we were. So let's not freak out about this Iraq like, it's something that it's not it was funny that this happened on the same day as serena williams also didn't announce her retirement trent bolt also didn't announce his retirement but all the reaction is about how they're both retiring and <laughs> strange um but yeah like the one thing that got me a little uneasy about it was the the comments from i think it was david white um saying like well you know trent understands that that uh by by um withdrawing from his contract sometimes we we're gonna have to prioritize the contracted players and selections we're not always blah 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 and i'm thinking well first of all i'm getting angry at something that hasn't happened yet and i have to check myself and realize like, sitting there watching this on the news and being like well they haven't actually picked like blair tickner or whoever ahead of trent bolt for a test match yet so <laughs> let's not get mad at something that hasn't happened that's all hypothetical calm yourself down there um so i did so i calmed myself down there but i'm still a little uneasy about the way that was worded um my hope is that it it's just the black caps putting a line in the sand and saying like public facing thing this is how it has to be where you know we have to protect the the validity of our um of our contracts and everything our contracting system even though they continue to pick jimmy nation for 2020s um, regardless of the fact he doesn't have a contract and there are contracted players in that squad um like michael bracewell for example could have played to get ahead of him in that first t20 against the west indies but didn't um jimmy nation fantastic cameo at the end too um smashing boundaries just as he was doing against all the european teams contract or no contract what do you know um so yeah that's my hope is that the black caps system is just like in public we say this but privately we understand that Trent bolt's just going to pick and choose when he wants to play um probably a lot more home games than away games maybe the away games are mostly just big tours and major tournaments and other than that nothing um which, to be honest, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't be that upset about. It's kind of what, as we're saying, like, moral of the story, it's kind of what we had already. Um, 
but I do hope because I agree with you, it would be beyond bonkers to pick anyone other than Trent Bolt for a for a home test series in which Trent Bolt has said, "I'm ready, I'm available, or I'm willing to play." If that's the case, Trent Bolt plays every single time, whether he has a contract or not. I don't care. No one else should care either. Um, and if you were going to pick someone else, even if it's someone like Matt Henry, who has a good case to be getting that opportunity kind of thing, you still don't pick Matt Henry over Trent Bolt. It's Trent Bolt is the you know, second best seamer this country has ever produced. Um, yeah, I, it's a rare situation, but if anyone has, has earned the right to be able to pick and choose a little bit, it's a... 33 year old fast bowler who's done nothing but take wickets in the whatever 13 years I think it is since he first played for the national team like if anyone has earned the right to pick and choose it's that guy we know bowling is tough into your mid 30s especially when you started very young like that like James Anderson is a freak is no one else is doing that he's the first guy before to be bowling still taking wickets at that level at that age um, and no one else is matching him doing that uh, you can't expect Take that to be the norm. Trent Bolt, fair enough. Like I all goes just yeah. The, if he's available, he plays though. That's the only thing I have to say. Like he, it, we we can't talk ourselves into any other situation with it being like logical or valid. If, if he wants to play, let him play. If he doesn't want to play, that's fine. That's the agreement that's just been decided, right? Yeah, but you can't expect New Zealand cricket to come out and say the opposite, like. They're not going to come out and say our contracts yeah, exactly. do not yeah. matter. <laughs> like, there's just the sort of like common sense approach that they have to take. There could be a like the only change I can really see, or like a notable change, would be that Trent Bolt can just play as much IPL as he wants, and but that's not even a change because, well, first and foremost, I think Trent Bolt is the best seamer in the world right now. No other seamer is doing what he does in all three formats for as long as he's done it. So, yeah, I'll tell all bias, but I reckon Trent Bolt's the best seamer in the world, and Trent Bolt is probably the best Kiwi IPL player over the past five years. Longevity, you could stretch it out to a decade. Um, and New Zealand cricket have always let their players play IPL. Like, that is the agreement they have made with the like pretty much the players association and Trent Bolt's been able to play IPL but now he could just play all IPL as opposed to like I've got to leave the IPL to go to this tour but even then New Zealand cricketers uh worked with the players to let them stay in the IPL and join a black cap series late like that has happened already so that's not going to be a change I would like to see Trent Bolt play big bash league and this might open him up to do that but like if Trent Bolt's not on an away tour and Trent Bolt's kicking back in Aotearoa and Trent Bolt's playing for Northern Districts, that is fun as well. Like That is really cool for Kiwi cricket fans to have someone like Trent Bolt on the domestic circuit. He might play Plunkett Shield, then he's going to play Super Smash because every after every game, he can go back to Tauranga and be with his whanau. Like I think that's a really fun wrinkle as well. Like We want these players... Like just having these players in the domestic circuit is really fun for Kiwi cricket fans as well because what's better than a lazy Friday afternoon watching Trent Bolt come in at number... He might be number 9 or 10 for Northern Districts in a Plunkett Shield game and watching the Flamingo from an embankment. Like That seems like a pretty cool summertime activity, let alone watching Trent Bolt bang sixes, let alone watching Trent Bolt take wickets. So... I don't know, it's just a interesting situation, but the contract stuff is something that we have followed because every time there is a contract decision, it comes out as this big drama, but contracts don't mean anything to the Kiwi cricket fan, and we're learning that they mean very little for White Ferns or Black Caps selection as well. And I think there's going to, like, you, we've, we discussed the how bonkers it would be to select a contracted player ahead of Trent Bolt if Trent Bolt's available. Jimmy Neesham, his con he does not have a, New Ze a cricket contract in Aotearoa coming into the summer. That's also interesting. We've never seen that before. The women's side, I am firmly of the belief that this summer, the best players in domestic cricket 
a lot of them won't have white ferns contracts so then you've got the situation where the players who don't have white ferns contracts generally like as a as a whole as a unit are better than the players with white ferns contract and that's going to be an interesting situation as well because i don't think the white ferns coach ben sawyer dictated those contracts new zealand cricket might have dictated those contracts then ben sawyer came in as coach and then he's trying to make do with the players who have contracts you come up to the women's domestic summer of cricket ben sawyer's looking around and he's seeing the best players dominate Halle Burton, Johnston Shield, Women's Super Smash. And he's like, where the fuck did these players come from? They don't have contracts, but they're better than all the players who do have contracts. All three of these situations are coming up for interesting times. And I think it's just going to be fun to sit back and observe. Not necessarily from this global insecure T20 league versus international cricket situation, but more just like deep in the Aotearoa cricketing mangroves and the nuance and wrinkles and little predicaments that are arising at the moment. It's, it's, it's interesting. And we're tracking that as best as we can. And we're also tracking Black Caps versus West Indies. Aotearoa won the first T20 of that series this morning. These games are coming thick and fast. This series will be over by the time we do our next Patreon podcast and we'll dive deeper into this series for our Patreon podcast. You mentioned Jimmy Neesham. All Jimmy Neesham does is smack boundaries. He, uh, 33 runs, strike rate of 220, so that's in keeping with his excellent mahi. Kane Williamson, despite his uh, woes in test cricket over in England and his uh, horrible IPL campaign, he is always excellent in T20 internationals. He was excellent again. Devin Conway, for Crick Info, he doesn't have the minimum 20 innings in international T20 cricket to be ranked, but his batting average would be ranked third highest all time right now in T20 international cricket. So he's pretty good as well. And then the Black Caps just dominated with the ball. Well, not dominated, but they just they they won the game with the ball. Um, Santa took three wickets. Everyone else took a wicket. Happy days. I am loving this Black Caps T20 team wildcard. They, um, this is a really talented T20 team, I reckon. I think they're really good and they're preparing for a T20 World Cup. And come back to the Bolt situation, just watching this game wildcard, I reckon these dudes all like playing together. They're all around the same age. We said in the Patreon podcast that only three of them are under the age of 30, and each Sodi is 29. So he's basically in that same bracket. So you've only got two young cats, and uh, Glenn Phillips and Finn Allen, they're only the, the two youngsters in the squad. Everyone else is around the same age. Everyone else has been played a lot of cricket together. I'm pretty sure they enjoy each other's company, and it just looks like a fun environment for this specific group, which is a top tier Aotearoa cricket white ball group t20 slash odi squad um, and that seems like an environment that trent bolt would love to be a part of as much as possible let alone anyone else they all seem to love representing Aotearoa and playing cricket together let alone how their skill sets complement each other jimmy Neesham, he smacks boundaries daryl mitchell smacks boundaries glenn phillips smacks boundaries devon conway cruises to boundaries and Kane Williamson's Kane Williamson. We know Martin Guptill's Guptill. Seam attack, Southie, Bolt, Ferguson, spin attack, Sodi, Santner. This is a fun T20 cricket team with lots of good vibes. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still picturing, um, based on what you said earlier, like and just an image of Ben Sawyer watching some um, like Halle Burton Johnson Shield and seeing Kate Ibrahim score 100 or something, being like, hey, she's pretty good. How come I've never heard of her before? Um, that I, I think that was the full strength. I think that was Black Caps first T20 against West Indies. I, I think that was full strength. That's, that's the best possible team they could, like, short of tinkering for, um, you know, um, conditions or, or that kind of thing. I think that was one for 11, the best team that we could pick for a 2020 international. Um, and they won, so that, that was good. Good to see the best team winning. Um, and delivering, like, guys, the expected kind of guys delivering in the expected kind of ways. It was a really nicely put together batting lineup. Which I, I think I think that innings, they could have pushed 
200 had there not been the rain delay. I think that slowed them down a little bit because Williamson and Phillips had to come back in, get restarted again, and they had been looking all right. And I think Phillips got out quite quickly. Then Mitchell's got to come in and restart. Like, And they got, they got through to a big score, like 180 plus. Um, it's all good there. They took some early wickets. It took a bit of a, a hammering at times. Like there were a few loose overs in there, but like you're playing the West Indies in Jamaica, you're going to get hit for six a few times. <laughs> You don't have to miss your mark by very much. There's some powerful cricketers there who like to hit big sixes. So that's going to happen. But the important thing is that the Black Caps took early wickets up front. And I'm thinking of like, if this is their top strength team, what's different here from the 2020 World Cup final against Australia? Ferguson was injured for that game. Conway was injured for that game. I think that's it. Eh? I think, and because Mitchell obviously was had moved up to open. So here he is in the middle order. Um, but, you know, Daryl Mitchell's, going to do a job wherever he is other than that i think it's it's the same team so just it does go to show though like would have been a would, would have been pretty handy to have Devin conway in there against australia in that final would have been pretty handy to have Lockie ferguson in there against australia in that final especially ferguson because i because you know on the back of one of kane williamson's best ever innings in that game they did set a pretty hefty total for australia it's just they couldn't they couldn't do what they did here against the west indies take early wickets put pressure on from the start um, have them playing from behind the required run rate kind of thing. Just weren't able to do that against Australia, but with Lockie Ferguson in, wicked, like a known wicket taker, 2020 international leverage of what, what it would be now, probably 15 or 16 at the moment. Um, it's plummeting from the 14.7 or whatever it was a week ago. Uh, like, obviously that would make a difference there. But luckily, 2020 World Cup in a couple months' time, there's another one. And I, I would imagine Trent Bolt... Will play that it sort of was hinted that maybe he's just going to sort of like prioritize major tournaments and not play that much elsewhere as far as 2020 go like playing ipl and a few leagues a few other leagues around the world is perfectly good preparation for a 2020 world cup like, like it's arguably better preparation for a 2020 world cup they're playing a three test series at home against sri lanka you know <laughs> it's, it actually might be a higher standard and more like a of a, um, like you know the the cauldron of competitive um, cricket big games uh, like high profile kind of thing actually might be better for Trent Bolt to be doing that as far as 2020s go either formats is a different story but you know so it goes we don't play much ODI cricket anyway and if he only plays the home test matches so, so it goes that's also still pretty good <laughs> still pretty handy to have Trent Bolt for those games so um, yeah I, I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty happy with how they performed in that um, in that first. 2020 against the West Indies and I look forward to seeing that full strength team many more times throughout the rest of the year because that is that is that is an 11 to be reckoned with you know yeah and to uh, restate this Devin Conway and Lockie Ferguson missed the T20 World Cup final last year and to start their careers they are among the best T20 international players ever so they might be useful we'll see like they need to 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 be ranked and to offer some sort of measurement to the listener and the audience and kiwi cricket fans they need to meet a minimum requirement for crick info so we'll be tracking that closely but their stats right now are among the best t20 international cricketers ever so they will be useful in a black caps t20 first 11 uh let's crack in some nrl footy here wildcard just to finish up and i'll start i've got a couple deep cut notes here i won't we don't need to go over every game or every bit and piece like we have uh chock a block podcast for this week shout out to aotearoa sport let's start with your dragons but fuck your dragons because they're facing the canberra raiders wildcard unfortunately joseph tarpin is out injured but i am curious as you'll be the dragons fan so you'll get a first up close up glimpse at uh, Matthew Tomoko, Mount Wellington Jr. from Aotearoa. Oh, bit of a bit of an Auckland Grammar School shout out here. We had Tucky Ferenson, Auckland Grammar. Matthew Tomoko played first fifteen for Auckland Grammar um, while having a, a notable, successful rugby league junior career in Auckland as well. And he is starting centre for the Canberra Raiders. I. Th- 
think Matthew Tomoko plays right center usually. So I'm not sure if you can... I, I want to see a Matthew Tomoko versus a Zach Lomax matchup, but I don't know if that's going to happen wildcard because I think they both play right center. So it might be Matthew Tomoko versus Jack Bird. Yeah. Either way, Matthew Tomoko is better than both of them. And uh, you'll witness that wildcard when the Canberra Raiders take on the Dragons. Any quick thoughts there? Well, yeah, I look, I look forward to realizing that <laughs> the up-and-coming dude is better than the two established uh, Dragons players in that position. I've already learned that a um, couple of weeks ago when Griffin Niami came in and dominated the Dragons forward pack. So I guess it's another harsh lesson on the on the horizon. That I'll, I'll keep a close eye on that one. I'll see how that goes because, yeah, um, that sounds like fun, particularly in a Kiwi NRL week with it. Is you know um, you said uh, Tuppany has been injured and and um, Jerome Hughes got injured last week and Fisher Harris is suspended and foreign is a couple of the like some of the top tier dudes not quite available at the moment um, which creates a window of opportunity to put some you know sharp focus on dudes like Matthew Tomoko and that's fun that's it's the right time of the season to be to be having that kind of thing as well because everyone's sort of taken a little bit of a um, except for the teams that are absolutely gunning for like seventh or eighth place. Everyone else is kind of taking a little bit of a breath and let's make sure we're ready for the playoffs kind of thing. Finals footy is where it's at. Good opportunity. Oh, some teams are just completely out of the mix and therefore they're looking towards next year and stuff like that. It's kind of that those rounds now where that becomes to be a little more of a focus. So yeah, I, I look forward to that. I'm sure you've got a few more guys to highlight as well. I don't know why I think Kieran Foran's out injured, but he's playing for sure. So shout out Kieran Foran. Um, battling on Hati Aotearoa Kiwi uh, Broncos Timari Martin comes back in for the Brisbane Broncos unfortunately the Dean Mariner two game stint hey. didn't didn't like work out as far as Brisbane Broncos wins go but that's not Dean Mariner's fault like he was selected for a reason and I don't know what that reason was now that they've just like disposed of him ASAP um but like it coincided with uh, Tessie New being fullback ahead of Temaire Martin and Dean Mariner was selected ahead of Brinko Lee. So I'm not sure like what old mate Kevy Walters, what his specific reasoning was, but Temaire Martin, he won like five consecutive games starting at fullback for the Broncos returning to the NRL, which is a uh, fairly notable achievement for Temaire Martin joining the Warriors next season. And how about this? A little plug for the email tomorrow. Going to dive deep into Aotearoa Warriors matters. Not necessarily to Maire Martin, but I don't know. There's, the Warriors have good players for next season. Like Let's just say that. But I am interested. To Maire Martin starting at fullback for the Brisbane Broncos. His return. I think he lost his last two games starting for Brisbane Broncos, one of which might have been a game in which he got injured and had to leave early. So I'm curious, like, just what that looks like for Timaida Martin moving forward. Because he, what Timaida Martin does at fullback isn't necessarily eye-catching. He's not Joey Manu. He's not catching the ball, uh, one pass off the ruck, running it straight into forwards and gathering big meters, lots of touches on the footy. Timaida Martin is more of a subtle fullback. He's going to be in the right place more often than not, and he's a very good distributor. Also good enough running the footy. Broncos have big out outside backs, Selwyn, Cobo, Corey Oates. So Tamari Martin is probably going to pass to them when he catches a kick. Um, and then he adds some polish to the uh, Broncos attacking movements, which is crucial. And hopefully it's just proven Tamari Martin a better fullback than Tessie New for the Broncos. The Sharks have got KL Iro on their extended bench. He is a notable player because he did come through Mount Albert Lions in Auckland, but I think he was born and raised in the Cook Islands and then moved to uh, Auckland. And his father, I can't remember which Iro, Kevin Iro, Tony Iro is his father, but his father is doing some massive work like ocean conservation stuff in the Cook Islands as well. So shout out to the Iro Fano. And KL Iro has earned an NRL contract for the next few years. 
and he's named on the extended bench after leaving the Warriors a few years ago. I think him and Tyler Slade left the Warriors to join the Sharks system, not the Sharks NRL team, but the Sharks system. And now KL Iroh has commanded NRL opportunities, which is really impressive for him. They play the, uh, the Tigers. So the Sharks should win that game. Good Kiwi NRL presence again. Braden Hamlin Uele, Ronaldo Molotalo, Britton Nakora, they're all there as per usual. Your boy Griffin Niami, he has uh, got a tough matchup against the Roosters for the Cowboys. And another little interesting deep cut here, Wildcard, is there's a dude, Siwa Wong, otherwise known as Josh Wong. He is from Auckland. He went to Mags, but the Roosters picked him up super early. He was shipped over to Sydney. He was placed in a school. He was placed in Roosters accommodation. And he, I think he's flag eligible. He's quite a young dude, but he is leapfrogged other forwards to get roosters opportunities i think he scored a try in a trial game earlier this year and now he's also named on the extended bench so keep an eye on for siwa wong josh wong he's been playing a lot in reserve grade he's a really good forward who the roosters salary cap sombrero uh, resource type of discussion what do we know about the roosters it's not their salary cap it's what they do with the younger players and how they develop them, how they recruit them from Aotearoa, Aotearoa. The money they invest at them at that age pays dividends. And last note here, wildcard, Offahiki Ogden is on the bench for the Parramatta Eels. Mangari East Jr., another former warrior, he left the Bulldogs for the Eels ahead of this season. And he's named on the bench ahead of Makahisi Makatoa from New Plymouth. Makatoa has been fantastic for the Eels in, over the last few years. But Ogden has been selected ahead of him for this week's footy. And I think this is his first game for the Eels since leaving the Bulldogs. What do we know about Kiwi NRL players who leave the Bulldogs? They get much better. Remus Smith was with the Bulldogs, goes to the Storm, fantastic. Morgan Harper was with the Bulldogs, recruited by the Bulldogs from Aotearoa, leaves the Bulldogs, starting centre for the Sea Eagles. Off the Hickey Ogden, Bulldogs signed him from the Warriors, and now he's gone to the Eels. We also know the Eels are a really good development club as well. So just a couple deep cuts there. The Warriors are playing the Bulldogs, who cares? And Panthers versus Storm is Thursday night. Am interested in how the Storm progress through this season, but they're uh, they're playing tonight, so we'll we'll leave that. Might touch on that one in the email tomorrow as well. There we go. Um, I was going to ask, do you think the Warriors will win another game? Uh, this season they do have the dogs here and i think they play the titans in the last round but then i also thought i'm not sure it matters <laughs> I, don't, no, I don't i think stacy jones would like to get a win um, um there are another one i think he got he was in charge for the tigers win, wasn't he? um but other than that i don't I, I think the warriors are probably in that zone where it's like let's just finish the season <laughs> it's just and I've, I've i've played for teams um sports teams in the past where it's like that as well it's like and i can only imagine how much worse it is at like a high level where you're where you're like fully professional when there's media on your back all the time and you're like it's just it's can, can we just get the fast forward button like a month and and be done with it and then uh look forward to pre-season training for once <laughs> it's, it's kind of the zone it feels like the warriors are in um and i don't envy him that i i certainly don't envy him that what is the best Aotearoa sporting thing for a losing team or a team with a bit of drama? I personally would say, I mean, like for like if I'm a player in the Warriors right now, I'm thinking the best thing would just be if everyone turned and looked in the other direction and stopped talking about us. So what is the thing that creates that? 
um, when people do the exact opposite <laughs> and put full focus on them and uh, like accentuate all the tiny little mistakes of a losing team and um, get overly critical and all those kind of things. And who's the team receiving that right now? Um, it's, it's, I'm going to make a joke about Ricky Stewart, but um, uh, it's the Warriors, I assume, is what you leaning towards. No, 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 no. The best thing for any struggling Aotearoa sports team is a crappy All Blacks team, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. okay. Because yes. no one gives well, no, one, yeah. no one gives a shit how crappy that's, the that's Warriors actually, are. That's actually a really good point. <laughs> yeah, like if now is your time to be shit. <laughs> they did two weeks ago, before the Irish rugby team turned up. <laughs> it's like um, it's like uh, what's that word? Um, uh, I can't remember what the word is, but it's like this is the free pass moment for for other teams just to to lose lots and be disappointing. And, and this is, um, fuck, I can't remember the word is, but yeah, this here's your little sanctuary of um, like rubbishness, sanctuary of disappointment. No one's going to notice. Exactly. Right. Yeah, we'll wrap up the niche cast there. We'll be back next week with uh, Patreon podcast, variety show podcast, big yarns coming out over the weekend, an email tomorrow. Big it up to yourself. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. Mori ora. Cha cha.